really see that text in the last slide, so you're going to thank me later. I'm going to leave that in the next year. Are you going to tell you off the coach of the football? This man needs no introduction in the Australian Frisbee community, so I'm going to keep it quick. Um, Max has been the assistant coach of the Blue Bowls in 2015, co coach in 2018, a leader on the bench, Frisbee house party, dream team, and probably various others that I'm not aware of right now. And this session was actually prompted by people. <laughs> yep. um, this session was uh, prompted by people requesting Max to talk about um, team culture and team buy-in and team mental game because it's been seen from the outside that it's a common thread in all the teams that you've been involved with. Leading. So we are hoping to hear more from the inside. Take it away. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, I want to say straight off the bat that if you have any questions at any time. Tell me, obviously, but more specifically, I consider myself and the teams that I run in terms of culture a totally open book. So, if you have really specific, like, goss type questions that you want to ask me about teams that I've run or be involved in, so whether that be bench or frisky or um, uh, the blue bottles or anything else like that, obviously, I'm, I may answer your question. I'll, I might not be, but I really want to be an open book. So, if you see something here and you think I'm talking about something specific and you want to ask about how I've done in the past, Please do also ask questions about how your specific teams could potentially implement the things here. Um, the presentations before are amazing. This is going to be super unsciencey uh, compared to that last one. There are no graphs. Oh, I like there's one graph. <laughs> um, so get ready for that. Um, I thought I'd probably start by talking a little bit about um, probably one of the hardest moments I experienced as a coach recently, uh, and this was losing uh, the showcase game in front of you know, lots of uh, crowd in uh, Perth and lots of people watching at home um, with the Blue Bowls. Um, that started this year. Um, you know, we were 7-1 up. We lost half 8-7 and then went on to lose the game um, on Universe Point and it was incredibly tough. Um, it was hard as a coach because it felt like sort of failed the team um, and it was hard on the players because there was a lot of pressure to perform. We talked a lot about it um, and we didn't live up to the um, but the one thing that I was so grateful for was that um, in the moments after we lost this game and in the days afterwards, what kicked in was all the stuff that we've been working on beforehand. What kicked in was the preparation, um, the belief, um, the conversations, the trust in each other, all of those elements kicked in. And although it took a little bit of time and probably something almost resembling a bit of grief, um, then when we came back and played another streamed game um, against GB, who we'd been talking and thinking about a fair bit, we won. And we won in convincing fashion. And we played, most, the thing I was most proud of is that we played in a style that we were really happy with. At the end of that campaign, the thing that I was most surprised by was that it wasn't this game against GB that most people had remembered most fondly. It was actually our losses after this game in the semi-final and in the um, bronze medal match, people talk so fondly about those games, not because we won or lost, but because we played how we wanted to play and we were proud of achieving goals that we'd set that weren't tied to results. So um, that this whole experience has brought home how important team culture is basically, because that first game could have just been the end of it, right? A complete collapse, and I've spoken to many people who have been part of even world's campaigns where one loss has defined their entire experience. And I was so proud that it wasn't a loss that defined our experience um, because we didn't allow it to based on the strength of our team culture. So, um, this was meant to be the title of my session, Team Culture, Mental Strength and Buy-in. I think all of these things are really important, but I guess I wanted to highlight that I don't think you can have buy-in unless you have a strong team culture. There's nothing ultimately to buy into unless you have something that you've agreed upon that would be your team culture. You actually don't have to agree on it. Your culture can exist regardless of that. But without that, there is no buy-in. And similarly, mental strength, its effectiveness needs to be built on a foundation of team culture. 
You can be a mentally strong individual, but you will not be a mentally strong team unless you have these team culture elements. An example I can give you is probably Frisky um, at World Clubs this year, where a lot of our players have played world representative campaigns before. They knew the demands of a world's campaign and they knew the mental strength, the preparation, all the little things, visualizations, all those elements. Um, but I think because we hadn't necessarily discussed our team culture in um, an explicit way, I felt that a lot of people found it hard to engage with those mental strength elements. And I think they were less effective because of um, not having a team culture which we had discussed in a really meaningful way. So, I don't think I need to really convince any of you, hopefully, of the power and the importance of team culture. Um, I think that's probably why you're at this session, because you think that it's an important thing that you need to build. Um, but I would like to ask you guys, just straight off the bat, what you think, uh, why team culture is important. So if you wouldn't mind, just for, for my own purposes, if you could just turn to the person next to you, or just get in a small group, you got 60 seconds, come up with all the reasons why team culture is important. Whoever comes up with the most wins. <laughs> Go. 55 seconds. <laughs>
of your team culture. You know, Mike Neal liked to say, your team culture is everything that happens, which is very true. Everything that you allow to happen is part of your team culture. I would extend that to say everything that doesn't happen or you don't do is also forms a part of your team culture in the negative. Um, but in terms of building a really strong and resilient team culture, you need to start at the bottom. You need to start with who you are um, before you can move to what you want to do, how you're going to do it, and then actually what happens. This structure is about being in control of what happens or doesn't happen. Not everything is within your control, but the having control of your own destiny is about starting at the bottom of this pyramid and asking yourself a little bit about who you are. So let's start with you. Whoops. <laughs> I want you to go backwards. <laughs> nice. Um, Okay, I think uh, your foundation is always going to be built on you guys who are in the room. So you individually, I think a really important exercise in terms of you as a coach, if you really want to start building a strong team culture, you need to understand yourself, right? You need to know a little bit about your own strengths and weaknesses, you need to know what motivates you, why you're doing it, the why that Sandra was talking about earlier this morning, what you're good at, what you want to teach your athletes. Um, this can be done in a variety of different ways, and I don't think anybody really knows themselves as well as they think they do. That's the thing that Cole would say. Um, but the, um, you know, you can go down the personality quiz route, and I'm talking about like the big five, or the, um, you know, Myers-Briggs, not the like, which Harry Potter character you based on, <laughs> what pizza you like, but like, um, you know, that might give you some insight as well. Um, I think you need to know that before you get going, because I think that will have a strong impact on the team cultures you build. I build team cultures that I know I would want to be a part of, and knowing more about myself helps me more actively and deliberately build team cultures that I want to be a part of. So that's been a growing and a learning experience over time. Um, next is who are you in terms of who are your team? Who are you in terms of your athletes and the individuals that are making up a part of your team? You can't build a successful team culture unless you've listened, you've asked, listened to, and um, assessed, I suppose, or considered, strongly considered, the athletes and the people who are part of your team. Um, because things like buy-in and, and mental strength, all that stuff, will be tied to the individual. So, um, one thing I guess I want to, that can seem like a really big job, I think, asking people um, what they think, how they feel. You, when, people, when we think about this, we might be thinking about like a big three-hour planning session and a goal session and all that stuff. I think that stuff is great and it's some of my favourite shit, all the little um, feelings and stuff, expressing all those in a big group setting. That's actually my favourite thing about Ultimate Frisbee. Um, but I would say even this can even be um, orchestrated at like a league level. Getting to know the people who are on your team, like why are they showing up to league every week or why they're not showing up to league every week, knowing those little individual pieces, that allows you to start to build a team culture. It all starts with the individuals. Um, so you can do it, you don't have to put out a questionnaire, you can just ask someone on the sideline a little bit about themselves and you can start to build a stronger and better team culture. Um, I think that is something that you clearly have to go off and do on your own, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, what I do want to move to is the what do you want to be section. So. Uh, again, I guess to, I think that doing a big goal setting session is really important. What it has to tie to, right off the top of the bat, is who you are, which is a distillation of the values that you find really important. So you need to decide, as a group, the values that you most value, or, um, the qualities that you most value, the, um, the things that you want to be known for, um, and also what you're aspiring to. So what Sandra, again, I'm just gonna copy the FDA framework, you, want to, you could create a vision and a mission. I don't think that's necessarily how to do it. You look at an ellipsis type model, they're very externally focused, I would say, which means that they create something that's really understandable to a lot of people. Now, you know, you know things have a vision and a mission that allows you to connect to um, a story outside of you know, your own experience, all that stuff. That could be one way to do it. You don't necessarily have to do that. You might go down the three word method a really common one that every Australian team since, God since I started playing, loves the old, like, belief destroyed 
love something. Three, <laughs> three words that they feel like encapsulate their team culture. I think that's really powerful and something that's a really simple way to get back to what you're doing. Um, you might be targeting recruitment, so you might want to make it big and bold and aspirational and external focused and fun and great. You might want to make it really personal to you and something that not anyone who's not part of the team is going to understand um, because that's a stronger way to build your team culture in the first instance. That's a decision that you have to make. Um, I would say the one thing I'd point out here is that in terms of goal setting, I think it's really important to um, tie it to what success should look like at the end of a campaign or um, at the end of a season or, or in the future some way. This is a pretty common thing that when sort of Anna runs goal setting sessions, she so asks you to frame it in a way that says, you know, at the end of the tournament we will be this, that, and the other. Um, or we will have experienced this, or we will have done this, this will be the feeling at the end. Um, it's something that's immediately easier to tie to, um, and I feel like it's a more aspirational way of expressing a desire to, to be something and to change yourself, especially if you're asking for people to buy into a particular team culture. Um, the example that, of the blue bottles that I would give is that at the end of the campaign, even though, for example, we've lost the last two games, everybody felt like we'd achieved our goals. We were exhausted, was, was one of them. We wanted to be exhausted because we put everything on the field. We wanted to be, um, we wanted to have played with everybody on the field and we felt like we'd done that, especially in our final two games. We wanted to feel like a family and feel really connected and everybody certainly felt that way in that moment. So um, none of those goals were results based. All of those were sort of feeling based and you know, we achieved them and felt like we've done a lot as a result. Okay, time for you to get your phones out. I'm going to try something. I don't know if this is going to be good or not. Let's find out. Um, I would say maybe just grab your phones. Uh, if you don't want to get your phone out, or maybe it'd be fun to do it in pairs. You can do it on your thing. So um, feel free to just look over someone else's shoulder while you do it. I don't know if people have Wi-Fi. Yeah, can you get the internet down here? No, it's a bomb shot. Oh, rip. I have the internet. Okay, anyone who has the internet, look over the shoulder of the person who, from, if you don't have the internet, look over the shoulder of someone who does have the internet. If you need to move more to the middle. Now, <laughs> how are you going? I guess this is a real, uh, this is a, could be a potential spanner in the works. It says it's not open for voting. Rip. Okay, now I have to open it for voting. <laughs> Please wait for the president. Okay, well I guess I better open voting. No. Okay. Has it opened? Uh, so it says no. Yeah. Close. 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 Oh, sorry. This is the code. My bad. The code has changed. That'll uh, Use 746735. Sorry. I'm in. Nice. Ooh. I'm in. Amazing. Yeah, me too. Okay. What I put in front of you is this. I'm asking you to rate 10 qualities of a great team culture in terms of how important you think they are and how much impact you think as a coach you can have on, the cult on um, promoting those elements within your own culture. Um, you could say, or you could put, I would, I would ask you to not rate them necessarily one to 10. I'd ask you instead to give a sort of relative measure. So you could put three as 10, but I would ask you to sort of spread them out. So if you don't think they're that important, put a two or three next to them. If you think they're reasonably important, make it a five or a six. If you think they're very important, eight, nine, ten, that kind of thing. I would ask you to put a spread um, down so we have a little bit of interesting data, but I'm not going to put too many. Um, Is that um, your impact as a coach personally? or Your impact as a coach in terms of your ability as, yeah, as a coach too. Uh, impact or increase the amount of that quality in the team culture. So, so you might say, as a cult, as a coach, I find it very, I would find it really possible, like easy to create a fun environment, but I would find it very difficult to create a like relaxed environment or an inspiring environment or an accountable environment. Okay, so this is entirely personal. Yes. Across the board. Yeah, I 
Well, so that makes them great under the E and A of team that swim. 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 Yeah, I think that works. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they went to, oh, they, I think they went, they swam together. They did stuff outside of Frisbee No, not related. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, what I want to do now, I guess, is go, is we're going to move to this section and then use the information that you just gave. I'll get to that bit in a second. Uh, so you've decided where you want to be. Let's talk about how you're going to achieve it. Um, I'd like to use some of that data that you've just given me for us to now brainstorm some ways to potentially achieve things in the categories that you thought you were un maybe unable to impact as a coach, um, but that you think of are of a high level of importance. So um, I'll just do a little spiel on in terms of how you're going to achieve things. Um, this is the section where you achieve, where you get buy-in. The gap between what you want to be and how you're going to achieve it, this is where all the buy-in, from my perspective, is generated. Because uh, getting people excited about a vision is getting people excited about what you're actually going to do to achieve that vision. And if people feel bought into what you want to be, then they'll come and do how you want to achieve it, right? <coughs> but that underneath part generates the buy-in for how you're going to achieve it. And making it super exciting about how you're going to do the thing that you're excited about, that's double excitement, which as far as I'm concerned creates double the buy-in. Maybe quadruple the buy-in, I'm not a mathematician. Um, uh, so in terms of creating um, structures and things to achieve uh, your great team culture, a classic UE slash Slytherin move um, is to know in advance what you actually want to do as a coach and then convince your athletes that they've come up with the idea themselves. Um, you can do that through structured conversations, through guiding them to, as soon as they say something that you want to hit on, hitting on that and going back to that, um, asking leading questions, emphasizing repeating things, just coming back until you get the answer that you want. Really, really important that you don't say, hey, how about we do this? Or no, it's like super important. It's way more powerful if they have come up with the idea um, because that way you'll get um, a lot more buying because it feels athlete-led. Um, I think a really other, another important thing about this is in terms of achieving these goals and just in general for a feeling of satisfaction, empowering articulate leaders in your group to be catalysts for um, achieving your like, goals Super, super important. Work out ways that you can empower your athletes to be leading your team culture rather than having everybody follow it from one perspective. It's great for sustainability. Like, if you are not there, then the culture will still continue to happen and to grow. Um, it's great for the development of your, um, your leaders specifically, to them as individuals. Um, and it's going to allow you to do more. It's good for scalability, I suppose, is that if more people are involved in doing it and coming up with ideas, you won't have to do it all on your own. Um, yes, the, the last thing is in terms of creating structures to achieve things, um, making self-propagating structures and then you being in charge of just stoking the flames, being the person who um, yeah, is the hype person who deals who just deals with troubleshooting of structures or who um, encourages people to remember to stick to the structures or to do the structures. So um, if you want like one simple example, let's say for a world's team, you have like a mentoring relationship between your athletes. So you're getting them to be involved in Facebook chats with each other, groups of three, they're, have, they're meeting every X number of days or they're talking about certain things each week, let's say, you, like, you give them a prompting question and they come back with an answer or they just discuss how they're feeling, whatever else, there's lots of different ways to do it. I'm sure Kyle, um, when they present tomorrow about the juniors, is gonna have tons of really amazing practical ideas for how you build an amazing team culture. But making those stru structures self-propagating so you don't have to do too much, so they're already talking to each other, setting up the Facebook groups, just prompting them with questions to continue to use those and then making sure they're talking to each other in those chats. So when you have a chance to interact with those athletes, making sure that they're doing that thing and suddenly prompting them to re-engage with those conversations, that's a much better structure than you having to do it all yourself. So let's go back to the data. Um, 
So let's see what you guys came up with. Okay, the thing that you feel the most ability to, the most important is a trusting team culture. Nice. Does anyone want to talk about why that was high on people's list of importance? I, I uh, yeah, I was right up there. Um, I know granted that was the number one thing I took away from playing that campaign was trust. Um, when you had complete and utter faith in everybody else on your team, you don't have to worry about anything. Um, and when you're not worrying about anything at all, um, it just makes you play so much better. Mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas about how the coaches like uh, helped you with that trust element in terms of building the team culture? Um, it was one of our values that we probably got led towards in one of our uh, coaching meetings. Um, he so doesn't know what we're talking about. <laughs> and so that was definitely one that happened there. But there was always this empowerment to us as players that we were incredibly good. Mm. And to me, that was the light bulb moment that all my players are incredibly good. I never have to doubt anything they do. I have complete trust in them because they were like, I have this belief that they are exceptional players. Yeah, love that belief. It's the best. Okay, great. Um, then let's maybe go in the other direction. Let's have a look at eight is way out there, although there's lots of, there's an interesting spread. Uh, eight is a selfless team culture. Does anyone want to talk about, um, they, a lot of people put it below half in terms of their ability to impact. Does anyone want to talk about why they don't feel um, like a coach can impact how selfless the team is? I think, uh, from my perspective, a lot of the influencing in this parameter is done around the selection process, and I think it's something inherent to people's personalities. And obviously, you know, they express themselves in different ways, in different contexts, and you can try and facilitate an environment that is selfless, but I feel like, you know, in season, working with a particular team, um, it can be difficult because it is something like quite inherent to just, you know, people's core personality. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, yeah, so obviously one important thing with, as, with that structure, everything is based on who you are, right? So if you have a bunch of people who are not selfless or whatever, that may not be a quality that you want to. It's, you don't want to voice the quality on people that either the people don't have, although I would argue everybody can be a lot of different things if you create the right environment, but you need to make sure that people value that quality. And if nobody in the team values it, you don't need to voice it upon them. Um, or you could, the other option is to try and make them see some value in it and maybe get there through another method. Um, what I'd like you to do, with, we're, we're obviously short on time like every presentation, but I think it would be really valuable now, just in small groups, I would like you to pick probably, let's say selflessness, the other two that are low down are confidence and creating an inspiring team culture. Pick one of those in a pair, please, just do it in a group of two, if you can, or three if it's more practical, practical, and brainstorm a few ways you might facilitate a team culture that is either selfless, I'd love you to try selfless, because I have some ideas, um, confident, or inspiring. Some people put the impact on selfless as like 10. I'm yeah. curious if those people want their ideas work, because we just heard why it's not, can't make impact. Great, cool, let's do it that way instead. Who's got ideas about how to make okay. selfless? Yes. Um, so I coached Chaos recently for the LUP campaign and selflessness was our key team focus. It was the one thing we were focused on above all else. Um, and we started off in pre-July about having a thing where we all felt that switch from we'd be running around and we'd having fun. Now we're with the team, we're starting to think about performance. So we set our goal as it's not about me having fun in New York and achieving what I want to do. My goal for free tour is to make sure that you, my teammate, have a really great time. So we removed it straight away in free tour. And so it was all day, every day. I'm doing things to try and make your day great. And then when we got to the tournament, it just continued through so easily. Like it was it was totally from my players and I don't think I had to do another thing for it. Yeah. Um, just giving them one really easy thing to do for days on end. That's awesome. Um, anyone else want to add on selflessness, or does anyone who's been up put up high in either confidence or inspiring want to want to jump, jump in? Just 
make me a quick comment on selflessness. Um, not something that I've done a great job with in my teams, but the most famous example internationally is probably the All Blacks, um, with their mentality of respect for the jersey and for the team. There's a strong culture in the way they operate, both internally and the way they interact with external groups, in that it's a very selfless culture there, so it might be something worth looking into. Does anyone want to, um, anything that they've done in selflessness or confidence or inspirational culture would be super interesting if you think you have it. Can I have a plan for that? Yes, yeah, sir. Um, on confidence, we've been doing good work on that with Monstars um, in terms of like attacking from a mental strength perspective. Mm -hmm. And so just kind of like talking about confidence as not a feeling but like set of actions. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like some exercise we've done is getting people to visualize feeling quite nervous and I'm sure. Um, but then still, you know, cutting confidently or throwing confidently or, you know, taking aggressive options and stuff like that. So, yeah, um, basically visualisations are talking about. <coughs> Amazing. Yeah, and I think that's sort of what I was getting at with that removing mental strength from the idea of team culture is I think mental strength is a tool to get to a really strong team culture in many ways. Um, and so you, you're using it as a, as a way to tie into team culture. So culture for me sits above all of that that other stuff and that, yeah. Um, I have a lot of confidence with teams that I've coached before. I've noticed that um, you're always being watched by the team, by the other team, and so your body language, more than anything else, will <coughs> uh, spread out through the rest of the team. So pre-game, you're frantically jotting down notes, scouting the other team out, trying to figure out what they're doing. You look frantic. That sets off the war on the wrong tone. And it just sets the wrong, you take the, the, the wrong first step in the game and it just all kind of falls apart. You, if you're fortunate enough to have assistant coaches, get them to do that. You stay with the team and feel like feel that energy as the as the head coach or the person being that um, yeah, the one that they watch all the time. And I think it's yeah, advice I give to a lot of coaches that you're you're being watched all the time, even though you don't think you're being watched. And yeah, that advice helped me a lot in this most recent Blue Bottles campaign where we like as a coach, I had a real crisis of confidence and needed to project confidence towards the team. So, um, which is sort of towards my point of creating structures or things that you can do that don't require a lot of mental effort on your behalf. And so um, it can be as simple as always approaching the team in a certain way or making sure that your body language is in a certain way, things like that that you know um, don't require too much mental effort or setting up, establishing patterns that it's just like, willpower or anything else, setting up patterns that mean that you don't have to think about it as much and be like, I have to project confidence. Just be like, I know that whenever I'm talking to the team, I'm going to take my hands out of my pockets or whatever else. Like, because these little things can contribute over time and then you'll stop thinking about it. You won't have to put any mental effort into it. Um, cool. I guess one thing I would like to um, emphasize about that particular exercise is you can see from the spread of results that <coughs> everybody thinks very differently about this stuff. So part of that is attached to you, and that's why you know who you are is the foundation of this, is you have a, a view and you have your own skill sets and you bring all that to a team. Everything in that list is impactable as a coach. You can, if you chose to, and if it makes sense in your team context, context you can impact all of those things. And the importance will be relative not to you, probably, but to your athletes. Your athletes will come with a view about what is important to them, and that's why it comes back to who you are, talking about what you want to be, and then working up to how you're going to achieve what you want to be. Because it starts from there, and that's, uh, yeah, you have the ability to control all of that in many ways, um, but your athletes are going to be the ones that guide you in terms of its relative importance. Um, cool, I'm going to wrap up pretty quick, uh, pretty soon I should say. Um, then what happens It doesn't happen, for me, that's like, it is, culture is everything that happens or doesn't happen, like I said at the start, but so much of it is out of your control in many ways. You have to accept that you're not going to be able to win every game or you know, some things, sometimes things will go wrong that are outside of your control. In fact, often things will go wrong that are outside of your control. Um, what I want to emphasize again are the controllable aspects, the things that you can impact, the things, structures that you can set up that can be effective. 
And the importance of putting all this work in in advance makes that last portion way more in your control. What happens or doesn't happen is within your control to a larger degree than if you haven't done all this work before. Because teams can win without a great culture. That'll happen. But teams can't consistently win or they can't win and enjoy themselves at the same time without a strong team culture. Um, to wrap up then, I would say the most exciting bit about this is we've been going up the pyramid. What happens when you then think about going back down? Because what happens or doesn't happen at the end of the season, right? When you come back next year, or when you come back next campaign, or when you go to training the next time, who you are as a result of the team structure that you've created is different. Like this whole structure exists to develop yourself and it exists to develop your athletes. And so when you come back in a year's time or if you look back on a campaign or whatever else, you are different because of the process that you've gone through with this culture, right? So when you're being a leader and creating a team culture, you should get excited about the opportunity that you have to change <coughs> that underlying structure, to change the who you are and who your team are and who the people you're playing with are or the people that you're coaching are. Like that is, for me, the most exciting bit about this whole team culture process is culture doesn't stay the same because the people who are part of those cultures do not stay the same and you have the ability to positively impact that. And that's the value of team culture. So, yeah, I think I'm done, eh? <laughs> I'm done, yeah! Uh, it's 12.30 now, it's lunchtime. Uh, you can ask me any questions you want, or you can all piss off. Oh, I've got a question for you, Max. In terms of um, when you're talking about creating self propagating uh, structures, mm -hmm. yeah. have you ever had experiences where the structure itself might have become a bit corrupted or you went in a direction that you didn't want to go? Perhaps people being excluded or yeah. any particular thing? For sure. I think um, one uh, thing that's really difficult is when you're trying to create a structure for a big group of people, that um, it's hard to create something that works for everybody. Um, you know, if you want to use. Um, like Bench as an example, and um, we've had like done a lot of different iterations of sort of mentoring groups and small groups of people that have tried we've tried to bring together. Not all of those have worked how we have intended due to personality things. And like one thing that I haven't even dealt with here, it's been very aspirational. How what do you do with people who are problematic and difficult in team cultures? Um, the answer is at the first step, getting to know. It's it's going back to the bottom of that structure, right? It's who are they, what is motivating them, or what is demotivating them, or what's causing them to be in that way. I'm not asking you to like totally psychoanalyze them and solve all their problems, because that is the road to madness, um, trying to solve that problem. But one thing I would say is um, that the, the thing is to not get so tied to your structure that um, it's not doing the thing that you wanted it to do. So for bench, we just, listened to the players who said this structure is not working for us. Like we had an aspiration that Div 1 people and Div 2 people would be talking together and they would be mentoring each other and building each other up and all that stuff. That was great. Except the issue was the Div 2 people felt like it was condescending to them in that way that it was presented. So we basically scrapped it halfway through the season and we reconsidered the next season and worked out more specific sort of one-on-one -on -one groups so it was like just one person talking to another person, checking in with how their season was going, and it wasn't, it was a one-on-one -on -one friendship building thing rather than a mentoring group that felt like it was one, one thing. Even though some people really valued it, like I would say there was three groups or two or three groups that really got a lot out of it, but that's two or three groups out of probably eight or nine, so it wasn't working for everybody. Those people, still friends, doing their own thing, one-on-one -on -one work way better. So, uh, assessing, I guess, and trying to change it. Yeah. Um, I agree with your your opening point about uh, that you renamed it to team culture because those other things can't really exist without the culture. And I think um, 
like when I give my talks tomorrow, I'm going to speak a bit about our culture that we had. Um, <coughs> I, think, uh, I wanted to know with your tech, with those questions and mm. things that you put in there, um, are those things that you value and you include? Because I, I answered all of them quite high. I felt like mm. they were all quite relevant and that I could have a big impact on all of those. For sure. Which is why I've been the first game. <laughs> 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 um, the answer to question is, yeah, I mean, the, the interesting with the importance thing, I suppose, all of that came through, that all of those were the top 10 things, really, that came through in that Blue Bottle survey. So all that, okay. those 10 things were pulled directly from what 24 athletes told me at the start of the campaign was the best team cultures they have been a part of, either the most successful or the most enjoyable. We asked those two questions separately. Um, and probably, unsurprisingly, most of the answers were the same for, for both. There were only a few people who had really distinct differences. Um, yeah, I think my point was definitely that you could impact all of them. Importance-wise, the, all those things are good. I don't think anyone would be like, oh, I don't want a hard-working and accountable team culture. Um, uh, but the importance is going to be guided by the athletes. And you should have an idea. You should have a sort of guiding principle. but the more that you can open up to the desires of the people that you're coaching or the club that you're a part of, um, that is for the best, I think, um, and will generate greater buy-in because it feels like it comes from them. It feels natural um, to be a part of. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're done now. <laughs> Let's go get lunch. Um, just before we go to lunch, I'm just going to quickly advertise for the next one in here because it kind of popped in and out and scheduled a couple of times, so I probably didn't get advertised. Uh, the next session is a series of short videos from people who have played at nationals level in both Australia and at least one other country, and they're providing a video with a bit of perspective on what they see the differences are between the other country countries and Australian ultimate. So essentially a series of those where we'll watch a little video, have a little chat, watch a little video, have a little chat. Was this last night? Yep. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, it came quite well. So you. Okay. Uh, no, but the, the plenary is also different for this afternoon. Uh, the physios are coming in chat instead of finish. Yeah. Oh, great. Sorry. Sorry, my man. Sorry, my man. Sorry, my man. The coach was the top. I was doing that. The three day session. Sorry. Oh, okay. My bad. Next question. Lunchtime, as you see it, is correct. <laughs> yes. That was really good. Pleasure, thank you.